Thank you, Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. So the second chapter of St. Paul's epistles, St. Paul's epistle to the Philippians, right? So the first thing um, to note about this epistle is that it's all about living a life of joy, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the prevailing circumstances. And this life of joy is anchored um, in Christ, knowing that Christ is in control of everything. He sometimes, or many times, he permits for things to happen. But these things, when they happen, he's still in control, and he allows them to happen for our edification. Now, in um, as you know, uh, St. Paul's visit to Philippi was not necessarily um, a painless visit, right? Mm. Uh, when he visited, uh, after he had cast out the, the evil spirit from the slave, he and Silas were beaten, badly beaten. They were cast in jail. Um, and then when God made the miracle, of the earthquake and their chains broke off and all the doors of the jail and were opened and the, the the jailer of Philippi took him took them home they came next day and they wanted to get rid of them and he said no <laughs> I'm Roman you you didn't give me a due process so there was um some pain but it's important to note that neither the imprisonment nor the chains con did consume St. Paul, nor did it change his disposition. He was bearing Christ, the source of life. And because he's bearing, he's carrying Christ, he was able to reflect a spirit of joy onto those he was serving, even in the midst of his suffering and their suffering. Um, and we also know that he wrote this epistle while he was imprisoned in Rome and so he's remembering some of the events that happened but he's and they're also suffering and he's he's suffering because he's he's thrown in jail but yet in all of that he is still what in joy so I'll quickly read um, over the verses 1 through 11 because I know uh, Mina that you said that this is where you stopped you did the first first Ver, uh, 11 verses therefore if there's any consolation in christ if any comfort of love if any fellowship of the spirit if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like-minded having the same love being of one accord of one mind let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit but in the lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And so we see here that Paul is presenting to the Philippians the icon of Christian life, what it means to live as a Christian person, whether in prayer, whether in fellowship. And he stresses that everything should be done with one accord, one mind. And what, he, what helps is that if we are of one mind, one accord, then this basically 
protects us from divisions. Okay, it, if I, if we are all of the same mind, then we have no more divisions, no more infighting. And he also says another thing that protects us from divisions, helps us to have one heart, one mind, one spirit, um, humility. Very, very important. He outlines humility as a safeguard for our life in Christ. And how does he and how does he define humility practically? He basically says to uh, if I'm to be humble, I'm supposed to consider everybody else better than I am, everybody else more important than I am. And he gives a, a an example of that, and he uses the example of Christ. Who, who emptied himself out. And so he's saying, okay, you guys want to learn what humility is? Think about what Christ did, because Christ emptied himself. And even though he is um, in the image or in the form of God and doesn't consider robbery to be equal to God, he made himself of no reputation, taking the, font, the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And in fact, some of the fathers think that true... Christ is, uh, our true humility is what Christ manifested because Christ as God came down to our lowly estate versus a human being and another human being. I mean, you know, human beings are dust. So when, when dust uh, uh, bows down to dust, that's not really a big deal, but it's the, you know, the fact that Christ himself, God of God and King of Kings and Lord of Lords came down, took on him, took upon himself human nature and suffered a terrible death. That um, is, th is true humility. So he's, he's basically saying, here is how we're supposed to live in fellowship, one heart, one mind, and humility. And everybody puts the other before himself and herself. Okay, so verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And it's important to note that um, the you know other translations say not work out, but continue to work, okay? So St. John Chrysostom says, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence. Why much more in my absence? Um, you seem perhaps at the time to be doing everything out of respect for me and from a principle of shame, but that is no longer the case. If then you make it evident that you now strive more earnestly, it is also evident that neither then was it done out of consideration to me, but for God's sake. And so what is what St. John Chrysostom is saying is that um, them being obedient in the absence of their teacher, in the absence of the one who had preached to them, is actually proof that they, out of love for God, are following God's commandment, not necessarily just because St. Paul is with them. Okay. Typically, when I have my uh, uh, spiritual father or my spiritual guide with me, they, their presence helps me to be on the right path. A lot of the times out of deference to their presence, I, you know, I follow, but, but much more in the absence of the teacher, they were more and more obedient to God because this is proof that, the, that their obedience is not out of fear or not just because St. Paul is there, but it's because they, they truly love Christ and are doing that out of their love for him. Now, salvation here, uh, and, and it's important, I want to go back to the point of continuing to work. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Salvation is not something static. It's not something dynamic. Uh, it's not something that has happened once and it's done. No, it is continuously, it's continuous life and, and, and actions that don't stop until we reach the fullness of Christ. There is no salvation without struggling. There is no salvation 
without striving against sin. Okay, so it basically means just because you started, keep going, don't stop. And the Bible has examples of those who started and did not continue. For example, Judas, he started, had a good beginning, and then he didn't end well. King Saul had a good beginning, but didn't end well. Um, we also hear St. Paul speak of somebody called Demas. And he says in Colossians 4.14, Luke, the beloved physician and Demas, greet you. So he was a fellow worker with St. Paul. But towards the end of his life in 2 Timothy, he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed. So it is possible for me to start well, but not to end well. And here when he's saying, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, he means it's not just about the beginning, but it is also about the end, okay? And here is, is, is an important concept. For me, as a human being, as well as uh, how God completes our salvation. So I, as a human being, I'm... Am, I am a co-worker with God in my own salvation, okay? God puts in me the longing for salvation. He gives me the aid over sin. He puts within us virtues. That is what God does for us. But what do we do? We also have to reciprocate, okay? He gave us... The salvation on, this, on, on the cross, we do what? We accept baptism as what? As death and resurrection with Christ. We accept the, the Holy Mayroon that endows us with the Holy Spirit. We participate and we practice the, the, the mystery and the sacrament of confession and repentance we partake of Christ through the Eucharist. Our salvation is not just something that God did for us, but we have to continuously work out every day on a daily basis. This is working out my salvation. This is striving on a daily basis. And he says, working it out with fear and trembling. Now, Fear here does not mean I am um, I'm afraid of something, but fear means extreme caution. It's as if I have something that is really, really precious. I don't want to lose that precious thing, okay? What is that precious thing? Eternal life. What is that precious, precious thing? The salvation that Christ did for me on the cross, okay? That is something that I... What is another precious thing? That I've become a temple for the Holy Spirit. So what do I do? I want to preserve it. Think about it. If you, if you have a precious jewel, what would you do to that precious jewel? Would you keep it in the open um, for somebody to come pass by and take it? Absolutely not. You would put it in the safest place. Likewise, we are supposed to protect uh, our salvation. It is something precious. It's something that Christ did for us, and he paid a very costly price for it, the shedding of his blood. And therefore, I, in return, have to keep it, take care of it, okay? Can I ask a question? Does that mean salvation fluctuates on a day-by-day -day basis? Like one day you're saved, one day you're not saved, no. one day you're saved? No. It, Depending it, on how well you're... So you're the like idea... Fasting well, or not that, you know what I mean? Like, so it's it's not that it is your your so you may have okay let's put it this way you may have good days and bad days huh? right but that does not mean our salvation is wavering okay what it means is we are still struggling through this life but just because i had a bad day does not make it 
the end. Or, just because I had a that, string of days or does yeah. not exactly doesn't mean I lost it. No. But I thought what you were saying was more like sanctification. I thought that's I thought salvation is more like in a moment and sanctification sanctification is what you're working, what all the things you're saying. So we don't our church does not believe in salvation in a moment. Yeah. Right. Um, so salvation for us is a lifelong journey. When you think about salvation, it started out with Christ dying on the cross. In fact, our salvation is not just the death of Christ only. It is death, resurrection, and ascension, right? This is what Christ did. This is our salvation. But I have to, on a daily basis, participate in that. And I actually participated in that when St. Paul speaks about the likeness of Christ's death and being buried with him. Where did that happen? Baptism. Don't, don't we do those things out of response to our salvation? Like, you know, thank you, Lord, that you've done this for me, and therefore I'm going to... No, it is not just out of response. It is an actual participation. Okay. Because I need to live that life. And that is why Christ said, take up the cross and follow me. I mean, every day on a daily basis. Does it make sense? Sometimes I think both churches kind of err different ways. Like, like the Protestants say you're saved in a moment and then, oh, I can just relax now and just chill out. But that's not really what they mean either. But then like, I don't, I don't like the idea of like my salvation may not be there at any given time, you know? Like, so it is, it is not that it is not there at any given like once time. Once I've decided I'm a Christian, I hope that it's always there, you know, like I hope God will always forgive me, always like accept me. But that's the faith that you believe God's there and that he died for you or in Christ died for you on the cross. Like if you genuinely believe that, then you keep working towards that. But if you like lose all faith in that, then I guess that's where it is kind of an issue. I don't know. I don't know if yes. what I'm saying is no, right. no, no, it's correct. It's also you know, we talk, we talk about that is why repentance and confession is an important aspect of our daily mm -hmm. lives, right? Because I may, I may struggle, I may falter, but it is because of what Christ did that I am able to get back on track through confession and repentance. You know, let's talk about Demas again. Demas was a fellow worker with St. Paul, right? He preached with St. Paul. He accompanied him on his missionary journeys. And then what does St. Paul say to, about him towards the end of his life? 2 Timothy 4.10, forsaken me, having loved this present world. So this is somebody who, who was an active participant, and yet at the end of his life decided, I don't want to do this anymore. This And this was a um, sort of a, a, a decision taken willfully on, on his part, right? So there is... Um, there is a part for a, a, a person's will and choice. And we'll talk about that also in a little bit. My salvation is there. It is up to me now okay. to make use of what Christ did for me, right? So um, trembling here also refers to um, deference to God. Again, uh, I, I, what Christ did for me is very precious. I need to keep it. I need to preserve it. And in my preservation of it and how I deal with God, I deal with God with utmost deference, utmost respect, right? St. Machaerus the Great says, um, a person who continues to work out their salvation in fear and trembling is a person who walks in all caution, amongst all the snares and the traps um, of, of the lusts of this world. And he asks continuously for God's grace and help. And he asks for his mercy that he may be saved by God's grace. That's St. Macarius the Great. Okay? So the idea is, I have to do something I'm in this world. I can't do it alone. I ask for God's grace. And that is why St. Paul says in verse 13, for it is God who works in, in you both to will 
and to do for his good pleasure. Okay. Can you read that quote again that Macarius said? Okay, St. Macarius says, a person who works out their faith, I'm sorry, their salvation in fear and trembling is that person who walks in utmost caution among I all the- I this on the web. <sighs> what was that? <laughs> That's weird because I never turned Siri on. Among um, all the snares and the traps of the lusts of this world, and he's a continuously asks for God's help and grace, and asks for His mercy that he be saved by His grace, by God's grace. That is. Thanks for repeating that again. So it's saying like, I'm just sorry to make sure I don't understand. So it's saying like, you walk daily, and like day to day life. You'll face different struggles, different temptations, different sins, but realizing that it's not you that could go through this, but it's God's grace. So you continually ask for God's grace mm -hmm. in order to get through that. And that is the definition of walking in your salvation, mm -hmm. or like mm -hmm. the part that you're doing mm -hmm. in order to work out your mm -hmm. Right. So notice that St. Paul here says, God who works in you both to will and to do. So I have to have a will and I have to do, okay? There is God's grace and there is my part, my, my behavior, my action, okay? So St. Paul always has grace and works. And he, God's work, man's work, okay? God is always working, but I also have to do my part, Okay? So he's, he's telling us because we are responsible for our salvation. And then he says, wait a minute, even though you're responsible for your salvation, be courageous, but also be comforted that God is also working with you for your salvation. Okay. He is the one who will help you. And this is very, very comforting in that God, not only did God save us on the cross, not only did God prepare for us or, or, or complete our salvation for us, but he's also working with us. And he sort of enables us to work towards our salvation. So that's why he says to will and to do. Okay. I just, you know, God, if, if God, you know, enables me and yet I do nothing, I'm complacent. That's not good. I once heard a pastor, I don't know what you think about this statement. I once heard a pastor say that the faith is what saves you, but the works that you do in your life are evidence of true faith. I don't know. Like, but that's what St. James says. You show me right, you right. by your faith. You show me your faith by your works. So if you're just not doing a whole lot, then you may not really truly believe. Maybe you just... Or you're not taking it seriously, right? You're not, com you're not continuing to work your salvation in fear and trembling, as St. Paul says. Okay? So what, what, what is very comforting here is that St. Paul says, is saying, God is not going to stand by and just watch you while you're struggling on your daily basis. And he's just going to be a spectator. No, he's actually going to work with you. He's going to work in you. He's going to help you. He's going to encourage you. Okay. And, and when he says to will here, um, basically he's helping us. He's helping our worlds because a lot of times um, that, is, that is an important thing that we struggle with, right? Um, I would like to do, I, I wish to do something good. Um, I want to walk with Christ. I want to be a saint. I want to go to heaven. Um, but a lot of the times, I, even those these are in sometimes uh, emotions and feelings and longings, yet I don't have the will to do them. And what is comforting here is that St. Paul is saying, even when you find yourself weak, and you don't have the will to do God's will, God himself 
helps you and enables you. He enhances your, your, your weak will. Um, he, he enables you. God's grace stands with you. And that is why this is very, very comforting. God is helping me. God is enabling me. But I still have to do something. It is God's grace that sanctifies my will. It is God's grace that gives me energy and power to do good. It is God's grace. He's the, after all, he's the one who created me. He's the one who, who created soul and body. He's the one who actually gave me the will to start off with. Okay. So he gave me the will and he also helps me out. So what is very, very comforting about this is that whenever we feel Whenever we feel down, what do I do? I look towards God. You know, I focus my, my, my sight on God because he's the one who's working in me. He's the one who's going to give me hope. And, and if I feel like I can't do it, God is there, not far away from me. And he is actually capable of what? Protecting me from the warfare of my adversary and enemy. It's kind of similar to what we were talking about on Tuesday, with, you know, have the, the big fellowship meeting, college meeting done on, we're talking about, you know, like lust and, and pacing that on your own. And what if you don't want to stop or what if you don't want to, you know, you don't have the desire or the will for it, but it's comforting to see that St. Paul is saying like, Christ gives you that will. Yes. And it's not really at the end of the day, it's not going to be you that's conquering this, but it's going to be Christ who works through you. Exactly. Exactly. So so it's important to realize I have a part, I have a role to play in my salvation. God has a role and I have a role. And in fact, St. John Chrysostom says, be not afraid. You are not defeated. Both the hearty desire and the accomplishment are a gift from God. For where we have the will, from now on, he will increase our will. For instance, I desire to do some good work. He has created the good work itself. And by means of it, he has created also the will. Or he says this in the excess of his piety as when he declares that our well-doings are a gift of grace. Now, so St. Paul says... God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So we talked about the will. To will and to do for his good pleasure. St. John Chrysostom says, for the sake of pleasing him, to the end that what is acceptable to him may take place. That the things may take place according to his will. So God enables our will out of his good pleasure okay a lot of the times we don't really understand god's will perfectly i don't understand the the way i don't understand how, what what choices to make but it is god who actually out of his good will his good pleasure guides me where to go what to choose, what to decide on. But this requires for me that I get closer and closer to God, uh, pray a lot, struggle a lot. Um, and when I do that, then I see God's grace helping me out. 14, do all things without complaining and disputing. So this is, this is a very important thing. Um, St. John Chrysostom says, when the devil, when he finds that he has no power to withdraw us from doing right, he wishes to spoil our reward by other means. So he takes an occasion to insu insinuate pride or vain glory. And even if that doesn't work, then by murmuring, so, 
murmuring or complaining is something that the devil uses against us that he may make us lose our reward okay and in fact this complaining is the first step to grumble and it is a consequence of what lack of patience a weakness in the love and disputing here means i'm actually argumentative and i'm doing things not because out of edification but out of my own arrogance i am opinionated i'm don't want to give up my opinion and that is why i get into this argument because i just want to argue it's not out of edification but out of my own arrogance and pride and this leads a lot of times to doubt in fact this um in in greek the the to to argue here is mean meaning to doubt and because of of such doubt and because of my arrogance i start getting to these arguments simply because i'm trying to be argumentative not not because i want to learn something okay so he's saying do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of god without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world can I share a verse similar to that? Yes, it's of really course, cool. please do. Maybe you guys have all heard it. It's pretty famous. But Ephesians, it's from Ephesians 4. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So I try really hard. A lot of times Allison will say, mom, can I tell you something about somebody at school? And I'll say, is it? You know, is it a good thing that you're going to tell me or you got you know, like, is it going to build them up in my eyes and make me and she's like, oh, probably not. And I said, yeah, I don't really want to hear it. You know? <laughs> or she'll, more importantly about her sister, mom, I need to tell you something about Marina. And I said, is it something complimentary where I will love her more? And she said, no. And I'm like, then maybe, maybe we better not talk about it. But like, I just keep thinking about that verse. And like, I need more in my own life that... I just want whatever I say to be good about somebody else, build them up. Like if they're not there, like if I'm going to gossip about somebody, I want to gossip in a good way. You know what I mean? Like yeah. If I'm going to talk about somebody behind their back, it's going to be something great and lovely. And then if I want kind of like complaining, keep it in my head. Like if I want to complain about somebody, I usually start complaining to God about it. But because <laughs> sometimes you can't stop your thoughts they're there but just tell god about how annoying somebody is i guess <laughs> no it's very good see saint john chrysostom says observe that he's instructing these people not to grumble or murmur murmur is left for the unprincipled and graceless slaves for tell me what manner of son or child is that who murmurs at every time, at the very time that he's employed in the affairs of his father and is working for his own benefit? Consider that you are laboring for yourself, that it is for yourself that you're laying up. It is for those to murmur when others profit by their labors. Others reap the fruit while they bear the burden. But he that is gathering for himself why should he murmur? Because his wealth does not increase, but it is not so. Why does he murmur who, murmur who acts of free will and not by constraint? It is better to do nothing than to do it with murmuring, for even the very thing itself is spoiled. For murmuring is intolerable, most intolerable. It borders, it borders upon blasphemy. It is a proof of ingratitude. The murmurer is ungrateful to God, but whoso is ungrateful to God does thereby become a blasphemer. Interesting 
Interesting mm -hmm. idea. They're saying like, if your dad owns a business and you work for it, and you're employed by it, there's no room to complain because all of the work that you're doing is for your own benefit. Exactly. And that's what he's saying here. Everything that I'm doing for God, why am I complaining about it? Because I'm really doing it for myself. And, and that is why, you know, St. Paul says, um, no complaining, no disputing. And in fact, um, if I have a sanctified will from God, if I am endowed with power from God, then if I have a sanctified life, if I am enjoying a sanctified life with Christ, then I live without grumbling, without complaining. Because I reflect the work of God in my life. I reflect the love of God in my life. That is why he says that you may become blameless, right? If I have Christ in my life, if Christ is guiding my behavior, then that is how I become blameless. Okay, and when he says harmless, meaning I'm 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 acting in utmost simplicity with everybody. I do not look to hurt anybody. That's harmless. I'm living so in a simple life, and this comes if I am truly in a fellowship, and I'm in I'm a partaker of the divine nature. Being a child of God here is a privilege, but it is also a responsibility. Why? Because children are supposed to be like their heavenly father. We're supposed to live blameless just as our heavenly father is blameless. I'm kind of looking at that word harmless. I think it's, I, I'm thinking about, again about James where they say like your tongue, you can do great. It's, it's interesting to think that the way we speak can make us harmless or harmful. Right. You know, you kind of think, yeah. And then James, I forget, I'm, I forget, but he talks about like the tongue is like fire. Yeah. Know. Right. Um, it's I, just, uh... Like you can do great harm or something. I can't remember what James says. What was it? The thing of the ship? A rudder. Yeah. Turn the ship one way or the other. But also, I think like somewhere in James, it talks about like how like sharp your tongue can be and do damage. I don't know. But... That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. It's funny that he thought his time was crooked and perverse. Yep. <laughs> Every generation thinks their time is crooked and perverse. But ours? <laughs> I don't know. Ours right now. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Which is cool because he's like, Again, he's putting a very practical idea of the change of a mindset, which like he keeps like hitting on almost like in every single like paragraph of this change of mindset, this practical way of how you could control the way that you speak or you could control how your mind is or you can control how much you're looking towards Christ and not really looking at yourself to be able to overcome these sins or these struggles. Again, very practical ideas, but that's how you, like he's saying, you become a light in the middle of all of this. Precisely. And when, when he says light here, it basically means these celestial bodies or a star. like, yeah, like like the, a star. Exactly, <laughs> like the, the sun or, the, you know, these stars, right? And so what he's really trying to emphasize here is, he's not saying you should come out of the world, right? He's saying, no, you are supposed to be in the world, a light to the world. You're supposed to be in the world, blameless and harmless. Because anybody who sees you recognizes you as children of God. 
So a crooked generation or a perverse generation will see you as children of God because you are not as they are crooked or perverse. Rather, you are blameless and harmless, which is the exact opposite of what the crooked and perverse generation is. And so it's like it mimics Christ's words when he says, you know, let your light so shine. Right. The you are the salt of the life. earth, right? That means we need to be different. Precisely. We have to be different. We have to stand out. Right? Sometimes I wonder if the church at large does stand out. Sometimes I wonder. I mean, divorce rate amongst Christians, I think, is the same as non-Christians. So. so the idea is I should shine and not let the world do what extinguish my light. That's the point here. If I am going to become blameless and harmless, a true child of God, my light will shine. But if I start partaking or being one with the world, quote unquote, fitting in, okay, in a crooked and perverse generation, then the light that is in me is going to turn into darkness and I no longer will shine. Now, but, but you see, it's important that we recognize this because it is God doesn't want us only to work our salvation in fear and trembling for our sakes only. But he wants us to be light such that we also bring others to Christ. Okay? So he's transitioning them from not focusing just on their own salvation, but to this also salvation of the rest of the world. We are an epistle to the world. We are a message to the world. We are supposed to be among a crooked and perverse generation, the ones that bring them to Christ, not them taking us away from Christ. Does that make sense? Verse 16. Hold, yeah. Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Okay. So the secret or the mystery of our own enlightenment and shining to the world is holding fast the word of life, which is basically God's word. In other words, I can only shine as a child of God if I am doing what? Holding fast to the Bible, okay? If I am not holding on to God's word, then how, what is the source of my light? The word of God is the source of my light. Christ is my light. How do I st stand fast in him? Well, through the, the mysteries as well as by holding fast to his word. And so he's saying, hold fast to the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. So when he sees as a father, so St. Paul here, as a father, okay, when he sees his own children holding true to Christ, that is a source of joy for him. He is happy. He's joyful in that God worked through them this great work. And he feels that all that the stuff that he did has not been for naught, has not been for has not been in vain and therefore on that day when he stands before god he's not just going to be rewarded for what he did for his own salvation but the fact that he was also instrumental in bringing others to christ and when we think about saint paul he it's like saint paul 
has a trail or a train of people that he brought to Christ. That is what he's thinking about. He wants everybody to do that. He wants everybody to bring many with, with, with him or her to Christ. Okay. Yes, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I've not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. So in the Old Testament, um, when the priest would offer a sacrifice, he would pour wine okay, um, on it. And this refers to spiritual joy. And so St. Paul here is saying that um, his daily struggles, even facing death, is kind of like that wine that is being poured on the sacrifice. Okay. Also, it used to be that mariners, um, when they reached their destination, especially if you know it was a rough journey, the seas were rough, um, when they get to their destination, they offer a thanksgiving sacrifice to God. And they pour um, onto it a, um, a, a wine offering. And the reason is because when you actually, when you do that, uh, it gives off a, a, a nice, sweet aroma. And so St. Paul here is saying, um, look, my struggles for you okay are like that wine offering okay and he emphasizes here the role of god in our salvation the role of each individual but also the role of the servant or the spiritual father or the church in our salvation Okay, and he's saying here is that our salvation is, is, is three-pronged. God's work in us, I, my own work, and then the work of the church or, or, or the servants. Now, how was he um, sort of a, 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 a joy offering for them? Prayers. He was praying for them while he was imprisoned. So our life are a sacrifice. Our prayers are a sacrifice. Our fastings are a sacrifice. Our holding on to the word of God is a sacrifice that gives off a nice smell. And people around us would recognize and see that in our lives. Okay? Which makes what? For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. A sacrifice is a source of joy. He rejoices in their salvation as well as they are rejoicing in God's work in him. So they rejoice in God, he rejoices in them, and God rejoices in all of us. So it's all about joy. The servant rejoices in the people. They rejoice in God, and God is rejo rejoices in the servant and the people. Okay? But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. So when he says, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, where was Timothy? At that point, St. Timothy was actually in prison with St. Paul in Rome. Okay? But he had faith that Timothy would actually be let go 
And as soon as he's set free, he's going to send them. Why? Because St. Timothy would be a source of what? Encouragement for them. See how St. Paul was all the time thinking about his children. They are worried about him because he's imprisoned. And so what does he do? As soon as he has a chance, he will send somebody such that they, can, they don't have to worry about him. Also notice something else about St. Paul. Not only is he worried about his, the people in Philippi, but he's also creating the next generation of leaders. And he's sending Timothy. So he's preparing Timothy for a leadership role. And, he's, and when he says, I'm going to send him to you, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. He's basically elevating Timothy in the eyes of everybody in Philippi. So not only is he going to send him, send them Timothy, such that, you know, Timothy will tell them that everything is, is okay with St. Paul, but at the same time, he's elevating him. And therefore, when St. Timothy goes to them, they will receive him. Okay? For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. In St. Paul's eyes, nobody is com comparable to St. Timothy in his service, in his faithfulness, in all the, um, in his sacrifices. He basically has the same sort of spirit that St. Paul has. And so he's saying to them, he is like me. He is like me. And because he is like me, he's going to care for you just as much as I would be caring for you. And so when they see St. Paul say this much about St. Timothy, when St. Timothy does actually arrive in Philippi, they will what respect him like they would be respecting St. Paul. They would receive him like they'd be receiving St. Paul. For I have one, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are Christ. And here St. Paul is referring to those who were preaching, not out of faithfulness or love, but when, if you go back and look at chapter 1, verse 15, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife. Okay? And so he's saying to them, he is not like that. He sincerely cares about you. He sincerely cares about the gospel. And here, we need to be very, very careful. Many people serve not because they really want to serve God, but because service for them is a way for them to stand out, is a way for them to exalt themselves, is a way for them to boast. And that is why he says, sincerely care for your state, your state, not his state. Okay. He's not preaching out of envy or strife, but he's preaching out of love. Okay. So he's trying to tell them here is a true servant. He's not the type of servant who is asking for himself, for his own dignity for his own um, fame, for his own selfishness, uh, for his own comfort. No, this is a person who's seeking what is Christ's. But you know his proven character that as a son with his father, he served me with me in the gospel. And so he's telling them he is a true son. 
but you also know that about him, that he served with me in truth. Now, he's reminding them of that. Why? Because the Philippians, they're worried about him. They would like to see him. So what he does is he sends them Timothy, such that Timothy will comfort them. But when he says, I have no one like-minded, and when he says, you know his proven character that as, as a son of his father, he served with me in the gospel, they don't feel disappointed that only Timothy came and not St. Paul as well, okay? Because he's sending them one who is like him, okay? Now, therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself also shall, shall also come shortly. So he, by faith, or he actually knows that he's going to get out, okay? Because this was, he did get out, okay? But he knows that he's going to get out. Um, but he, he's, he says, I'll hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. In other words, he's not free yet, but as soon as he's free, not exactly sure when that's going to happen. I will send him right away. Okay. Yet, I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. And see, even here, St. Paul, he, he, he says, okay, I'm going to send you Timothy. Timothy is going to tell you about me, and he's also going to know about the, uh, uh, um, how things are with you. But even before I send you Timothy, I'm also going to send someone else, Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier. So apparently Epaphroditus, they, the Philippians, had sent Epaphroditus with some gifts to St. Paul. They were caring for his needs. Remember, he, he was in prison. So... They wanted, they wanted to care for him while he was in prison. So Epaphroditus goes, apparently he gets sick, really bad, uh, close to death. And so he, he's, he says, wait a minute, I'm actually going to send him back to you, okay? Since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. So the Philippians heard that the person that they had sent to St. Paul Epaphroditus with their gifts he also got sick, and so they got worried about him. For indeed, he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So when they heard that Epaphroditus had gotten sick, they were sad. Um, and so Epaphroditus also got sad because they were sad. Okay. So he was unhappy that they now are worried about him. So another thing that St. Paul is doing is saying, okay, I'm going to send you somebody, somebody that you care for deeply, and he also cares for you deeply. He doesn't like the idea that you're worried about him having gotten sick. So I'm going to send him before I even send Timothy, because I want to make sure that you guys are okay, and you also make sure that uh, Epaphroditus um, is okay. Now... Notice that here he says that he was distressed and that he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him and not only on him, but on me also. So, uh, so why, why, why is Epaphroditus' healing an act of mercy for St. Paul? Because he was an effective fellow worker with St. Paul. He was a sincere servant. And so him having gotten sick meant that the service was going to get affected. St. Paul's preaching was going to get affected. And so he's referring to this act of mercy because now that he's healed, he can continue this effective ministry, and he can continue helping St. Paul. 
Therefore, I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. So notice, you know, this, this shared love, okay? He needs Epaphroditus to stay with him because Epaphroditus is free. He and Timothy are in prison. But what does he do? He says, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. You are sorrowful because you've heard that he is sick, so I'll send him to you such that you can see that he's better now and that you no longer have to worry. And then when he comes, he sees, they see that he's well. He also tells them about St. Paul and how things are better with him. And so this basically is a uh, um, sort of a comfort for all of them. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem. He's asking them to honor him. And St. John Chrysostom says, receive him in a, in, a in a manner worthy of saints, as saints should be received with all joy. Now, there are some who say uh, Epaphroditus was a bishop, um, became bishop of Philippi. Others say that he was already a bishop over a town in Italy. Um, but what we see here is an example of why we honor our fathers, the bishops. That's why he says, receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem. Notice that, you know, we honor our fathers, the bishop, the bishops, when they come, we have a, you know, we pray a certain hymn. We didn't invent that. That didn't come out of nothing. This is an example of where we learned this from, how to honor our fathers, the bishop, because this is something that St. Paul is telling them. Honor him, receive him in the Lord with all gladness and esteem such men. Why? Because for the work of Christ, he came close to death. So our fathers, they toil for Christ. Sometimes it's to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. So we honor them because they are Christ's servants. We honor them because they give up their life for Christ. Okay? So notice that he is laying the foundation for how the church deals with the servants, how servants are supposed to deal with the church. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Sorry, it took long. Mm -hmm. Stop the recording.